Welcome back there again, boys and girls, for the first or second or the first substantive video of our Flip in the Flip class unit on genetics. Today we're going to talk about heredity, and this is the story of a monk. That's, that's all I this got from that old song. You know that song, uh, kudos for you. Alright, so remember, those whole polypeptides come together to make the proteins, those are what are responsible for a trait. This is just running you through uh, the different levels of structure that they have. I remember this first structure, those are the peptide bonds. You got the whole hydrogen bonding and other levels of folding down here, which is important for remembering. Now, based on everything we know about the whole transcription, translation, all that deal, we actually understand heredity a whole lot better. So here we have a little diagram representing, you can see the parents. Now let's say uh, there's some kind of like defective gene. See, this is what the normal gene would look like. There it is. And here's the defective gene because, you know, shit. When we make the gametes, that's meiosis. Those chromosomes are split apart. Remember, they're just showing you two here, two chromosomes. Remember, you have 23 pairs of these things. So they're just showing you, you know, the two chromatids right up in here. Remember, you got to get to 46, double them up for the chromosomes. But you can see when you make the gametes, right, those traits, they're split up. That's the anaphase, right? And then down here, uh, those gametes combine to make the children. Come back to this diagram for help on the homework if you get stuck when you're told to make the gametes for the pea plants. Which brings me to this guy right here, Gregor Mendel. He was a monk, like, you know, vow of silence, copies the Bible for a living monk. And he is credited for discovering the whole uh, genetics dealio, but he did it way before we knew about DNA, before we knew about genes, and before we knew about any of this stuff. He did it because he was a big old math nerd. He was just, you know, out there uh, in Czechoslovakia, or what was Czechoslovakia before it was Czechoslovakia, just, you know, being a monk, growing little plants and being like, da 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 da, -da I love math. And based on the things that he learned in math, he actually uncovered the basic rules of heredity just out of like growing plants and seeing patterns, thinking like a scientist, and applying his mathematical skills. So for those of you that have been wondering like, oh man, what's with all the math in the science all the time? Yeah, this is why, because they're pretty much the same thing. Now he did this process that's called selective crossbreeding. For a quick recap for the non-farmers, in the land. Even back in Mendel's day, this was a very old concept. This is basically how like we invented different plants and animals like dogs and broccoli and other things like that that are awesome. Essentially, you, uh, you take two parent plants that you like the traits of and you take their gametes off and then you combine them, you plant that seed and you get yourself a new plant that hopefully has a desirable trace that you want and all of the delightful hybrid vigor so that you can make lots and lots and lots of them. Now he was pretty lucky because the plants that he decided to work with actually all had very easy to measure traits. They had seven traits, here they are here, and they're all autosomal traits. So remember when we did the karyotype, you talked about autosomes, versus the sex chromosomes, the autosomes, those are our regular chromosomes. And so autosomal traits are the ones that are found on those autosomes, on those regular chromosomes. For us, it's those 22 other than the sex pairs. For these, it's the, the I have no idea how many chromosomes they have. You look it up, Google, Google, Google. And he also noticed a pattern and when we talk about autosomal traits, we're talking about these patterns that he observed, talking about he, I mean Mendel, and that was a flower color. It could be purple, could be white, and we're talking peas. You could have the flowers that are axial or they're terminal, sticking on the end. They could be yellow or green peas. How often do you see a yellow pea? Hmm. The seeds could be round or they could be wrinkly and shrivelly. The pea pods could be inflated or they could be constricted so it looks like they were like freeze packaged and you know all over the peas. And the pods themselves could be green or they could be yellow. In addition to that, the plants could be tall plants or they could be dwarf plants. And you'll notice that all the traits over here on the left hand side, these are the dominant traits. That's right, yellow peas are actually dominant to green peas. Weird that you never see yellow peas and tall and yada 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 like they're shown here. 
Now this pattern, he broke down into being dominant or recessive like we just said right there. The dominant ones tend to dominate the recessive traits. So purple would show up more and it would show up over top of the white trait. If he took a purple plant and a white plant, he ended up getting a whole bunch of purple plants. So let's get into how we got green peas then. Here's a, a yellow and a green pea. When you mix them together, you get uh, the generation that's all yellow. And then when he would mix those generation, called the F1 generation together, he would find three with the yellow and one with the green seed, which is weird. And he did this across hundreds and thousands and hundreds and thousands of plants, because remember, he just lived in a monastery and tended the garden. Also, you know, he didn't have a whole lot of other social things filling his social calendar. And he noticed that this three to one ratio, three yellow to one green happened consistently every single time that he took these steps. If he took a yellow and a green and put them together, got all yellow. If he took those two yellows, put them together, three yellow, one green, every single time without fail. And so he came up with the ideas that there's some kind of factors that are being inherited here. And you can actually calculate these factors using the Punnett squares. He called these factors alleles because, you know, he spoke as a shaman once upon a time. And so the big Y was for the yellow color because it's the dominant trait. The letter selected is always the dominant version of the trait, Y for yellow. The big Y represents the yellow. The little Y, like over in here and over in here, that represents green. Even though green is a spell with a Y, but GIFs are pronounced GIFs and graphics and you see where I'm going with this? The letter. But yeah, this just says Y being the yellow and green, they go together. So if we took the yellow ones, he noticed that he was ending up getting green one-fourth of the time. And so what he did using his math skills is he realized that those, those F1 yellow peas had to have one big Y and one little Y and again, one big Y and one little Y that they could pass down. And so you'd get your three yellow to one green ratio every single time. Math and counting and stuff is the best. So we need to throw some more terms at your faces before we can continue. First term, phenotype. You need to know that the phenotype is the physical appearance of the trait. Just throw a big old pile of in front of it. And you'll remember that the phenotype is the physical appearance of the trait. And then there's also the genotype. The genotype, these are the actual alleles or the genes that are controlling those traits. This is what you don't see unless, you know, you invented like super awesome magic school bus that could get down into the DNA and actually look at the gene and say, yep, that's, that's the yellow gene or yep, that's the green gene. For genotypes, you know, phenotypes, these are just, you know, regular words like the plant will be tall. For genotype, there are two types of genotypes, uh, really kind of three, I guess. There's homozygous, homo being the same, so both alleles there, they're big, both alleles there, they're smaller, so we got the dominant version, we got the recessive version, tall, short, but because it's both the same kind of allele, we call it homozygous. There's also heterozygous, heterozygous. That's where you have one of each. See the big T and the little T come together. They're different, so that's heterozygous. Not to be confused with the ever popular heterozygotes who are just allele uneven. Now it's worth mentioning, you got these two plants. They've got the dominant allele, and this is what it means to be dominant. This heterozygous plant with the one big T, and this homozygous plant with the two big T's, You'd think that one was taller with all its extra tallness, but no, they are the same height. The tall shows up over the short, and the big T, big T, and the big T, little t, the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous plant are the same amount of tallness. They have the same phenotype, the same physical appearance. So you can see here that, uh, ooh, genetics, it gets crazy, crazy. So what the alleles are, these are the copies of those factors. Mendel determined that for those autosomal pea plant traits, the ones that he studied for very long amounts of time, that the traits have always 
two copies, which makes sense because you get one set of chromosomes from your mother and one set of chromosomes from your father. So you can see you have two copies of every gene. We call those copies of the genes the alleles. You can have dominant or recessive alleles. Keep in mind, this is all pre-chromosomes, pre-knowing about the nucleus, pre-really even knowing about cells so much. So yeah, that's crazy. Now based on all this stuff, Mendel came up with a couple of laws. He called them principle, now we call them laws. Laws, again, not like a super theory. Instead, what a law is, is this is where it happens every single time. It's directly observed. He observed the, what he called the principle of segregation, known as the law of segregation, that these two alleles, the two copies of the traits, seem to somehow segregate from each other when the gametes are being made. So you get one copy from each parent. Makes sense, we know that one. Principle of independent assortment. Should sound familiar from our meiosis unit. This says that each allele for a factor, if you're looking at multiple traits, if you looked at like blue, or no, sorry, let's do pea traits. If you looked at the tall plant and you looked at flower color or short plant and you were looking at flower color, those two traits, they don't go together. They independently assort from each other. This is where that terminology came from, from Mendel's Delia. And again, what's crazy is this is before we knew about chromosomes, because we didn't discover those till like the 1930s. And then when we did, we realized that segregation, that is actually anaphase. And that independent assortment, that was our metaphase one from meiosis. Ah! This is what I love about science, because when you get a solid theory, the more evidence you find continues to support that same theory. Mm, generations and generations and generations of awesomeness. When she we have a worksheet to practice those concepts in lieu of noodling this time. So here's the worksheet. You're going to need to answer everything on the first page. Here you're going to make gametes do a little bit of a pea plant sex and make some offspring down here. Make sure that you label with the bold things where they say label. This worksheet is designed that when you read through all these things, you'll be able to do all the questions pretty easily. So there's page one. On page two, you only need to do 11 through 14. You do all the first page, you do 11 through 14. We're gonna do this one together. If you do 14, you get through 14, you come up to me, I will check number 14. If you nailed number 14 and uh, 12 and 13, then that's it, you're done. You don't have to do any more work. If you missed 14, you missed these ones above it, in the combination of that, then we're going to go over it, you and me, and maybe other people if they, all, if they missed it too, and then you will complete the rest of the worksheet which is only like three more questions. If you're feeling frisky and you're like, no, no, I just love doing genetics problems. You could do the whole thing. I'm not going to stop you, but make sure you do one through 14, then come check with me. I'll let you know if you need to keep going. Thanks for watching, everybody. Genetics time. And if you wanted to jumpstart, the link for this file is in the description.